for to start this last session, we really wanted to have a, uh, uh, someone representing an, another uh, part of the industry. Uh, and with this for, for that, we will have Paul Lucas, uh, who is a CEO of the financial services sector at IBM and also a distinguished engineer. Uh, Paul will share with us uh, a talk entitled Old Means New, Managing Transaction on the Edge of the New World. Yeah, what's the new normal after all of this? <laughs> Hello, Paul, how are you? Hi, I'm good, thanks, how are you? I'm doing well. Are you able to share your screen with us? Yeah, let me just share my screen. Yeah, perfect. We've seen all the distinguished engineering skills uh, <laughs> in this beautiful click. It's always uh, embarrassing when it doesn't work. <laughs> but it works now. So yeah, the stage is here for uh, 25 minutes. Yeah, Great. enjoy, Paul. Thanks very much. Okay, so um, so thank you for, for those of you who've joined this session on old meets new, uh, managing transactions on the edge of the new world. So what I'm going to be talking about is uh, the coming together of cloud and API technologies with the kind of traditional mid-range and mainframe technologies and the ways they complement each other and the places where we need to do some work. And ultimately, to talk about the need to build a holistic approach on the kind of confluence of these technologies. So I'm an architect by trade, so I don't have a magic recipe, um, but I will offer some guidance on how we're tackling this and where I'm focused on in stuff with my clients. Okay, so, so a bit of context. So cloud APIs, they're all now firmly mainstream. They're, they're pretty much our default toolbox for everything today. I'm not gonna preach about why they're good. I'm sure everyone here could do a far better job of that than I can. Um, they've certainly improved um, client time to market vastly over traditional technologies. Um, all of our organizations that we talk to and work with are on the hybrid cloud journey. Um, you know, whether it, at one end of the spectrum, it's just for buying their um, stationary, right down to major banking transformations, completely replacing the core of banks. Um, so everyone is on that journey. However, there is still an awful lot of the technology that's been around for the last 50 years that is still around. We are very early in this journey and something like 80% of the um, IT that has been around over the last 50 odd years is exactly as it was unchanged. So we are very much in the territory of brownfield IT here. So the kind of old school heavy engineering and actually working out how we work with old and new together on this continuum of technology that kind of lives through time. And fundamentally, you know, we're, we're all in the IT business to solve business problems, um, not just purely for the technology fun that it is. Um, and, and ultimately, that's really about building predictability and reliability um, for clients. You know, I work in financial services. Um, operational risk is absolutely crucial and, and a kind of a major topic in financial services at the moment. And, and the best thing your IT systems can be is dull. Dull's great. Don't make the evening news, making the evening news really bad. Um, so really our job here and what I'm talking about is how do we make all this stuff mainstream and dull? Um, so, okay, well, what's the problem? Well, fundamentally, it's it's the need to get consistency for the overall organization. So for years, we, we had standard patterns. We knew how, if we needed a transaction monitor, we could run something under kicks, get a load of workload through it. If we needed a short delivery of messages to make sure we weren't going to lose anything, we could use XA transactions. We all knew how to build high availability, disaster recovery style um, architectures to make sure that we had our data was safe. And if we lost a data center, everything was fine. Well, that's great, but now we have to go and revisit the pattern book because we've added a whole new bunch of technologies to our, our toolkit. And, and what we lack is that ability for consistency. So the industrial revolution clearly didn't happen because everyone invented new and interesting ways to make screw threads. In fact, precisely the opposite. It happened because everyone worked out how to standardize all of those interfaces so that they could then innovate around new products and larger and larger assemblies that you could then make use of. And that's really where we are now, I think, with cloud and API technologies. We've got many of the tiny assemblies ready, but not quite on that full scale yet. So we need to come up with standard approaches for the new solutions. We can build new client solutions very quickly and cheaply, but integrating those into that broader brownfield IT estate and getting things into production and ever turning off any of that older stuff relies you know, it is a much, much harder job to do than just the simple functional new stuff. 
And so we need those standards to work out how we're going to work on that stuff. So, you know, take payments for an example, um, something close to home for me. The reason we can move money around the world simply is we have standard ways of managing the payments messages and all of the edge cases around when they don't work. So we need to make a bunch of decisions, but they need to converge on common solutions. And ultimately, new technology isn't going to win. It's just going to join some of the older technology. There isn't a date we can set for next year when all the old technology will have gone. You know, a lot of that technology is going to be around for a very, very long time in the same way that we have a this spectrum of technology for the last 50 odd years, scarily enough. Um, and the more moving parts we have, the more we have to maintain, the more there is to break and the more the need for that consistency across the board. OK, so so let, but let's talk about a bit, bit more in the kind of technology. Obviously, with any new moving technologies, there are two sides to the coin. There's the problems they solve and then there's the new challenges they create. And whenever I use the cha word challenges, I always think, yeah, it's a euphemism. I mean problems. Um, so, OK, so on, on the on the positive side. So so clouds and APIs have done amazing things for getting stuff rapidly to market. So if you look at the open banking, open data APIs, almost exclusively delivered standalone on the cloud and most of the banks wouldn't have met their regulatory requirement to publish that data without the new technologies similarly protecting our systems of record um, our ability to actually um, go and build a mid-tier data cache so use change data capture to push data from my systems of record into a data cache and then serve my channels through that cache allows me to protect my traditional systems from that much more unpredictable and much potentially much higher workload that I'm going to get um, from my new digital channels. And that's made a huge difference. Um, similarly, the ability to go and use API based technologies to put circuit breaker um, patterns in. So the ability so that when I actually do submits from my channels or from my payments networks or wherever that may be, I can do a conditional accept at the boundary and I can process that later. Now, that does add some complexity in terms of catch up, but it allows my core, my overall, my bank in my case, where I work, um, to appear to have now got the same characteristics as a high availability cloud architecture. So we, we get to inherit that always on elastic scaling and graceful degradation type behavior without having to go and chop up the core. So these, these are kind of there's very little drawback in these kind of implementations. However, on the other side of the coin, you know, there are some challenges. I doubt many people buy hi-fi separates these days. I'm very old. Um, there's a reason that your speakers and your amplifier are matched together um, with hi-fi. It's so that they can resonate together and not fight with each other because you want to maximize the amount of power the one can transfer to the other. And with our, in the IT space, that's exactly what we're looking to do, maximize the value we're getting from our old and new systems and the amount of, of, of value we can get from them communicating and working together. So fundamentally, integration is not a new problem. So this is not rocket science. You know, For years, uh, it's over a good decade, you've been able to get your bank balance and your latest transactions on your phone. But again, that's really just a facade. That's a data cache. And that real data is hidden away in a batch system somewhere and only really updated overnight. Similarly, you know, for data management, we've been integrating CRM and billing systems for years, both of which think they own the customer data record. And we manage that to allow them to both carry on thinking that. So in this new world where we're all cloud and, and API driven, we need some macro level strategies. And I don't I don't mean for individual components. I mean, for the enterprise of how we're going to manage end to end data, transa end to end transaction management. So how we're going to make sure we don't lose our data and it gets where we intend it to go. How do we um, keep our data consistent across our old and new IT so that we're not just dealing with um, discrete islands of data? Um, how are we going to manage this stuff end to end so that we actually appear to be a single company or corporation, not just a bunch of islands of operations and not just making the world more and more complex operationally every time? Um, how are we going to manage integrating reporting? How are we actually going to be able to ever use all of that data that's spread across our industry? our estate um, and we need to actually be able to get this stuff live so we have we can't you know particularly for some of the really big traditional systems we can't just turn them off overnight and cut over to something new we need to be able to do this progressively and protect the business and protect 
the client base from the risks of these kind of what potentially huge transformation jobs in moving technologies. So let's talk about a specific example. Um, so say I work in banking um, a lot in the, in the, the neo banking space. So imagine we actually want to go and create a new product platform. We want to create a prepaid card, new pre prepaid card proposition. We're going to create a new product platform using cloud technology. We're going to sit it alongside our existing core banking platform. So my new platform is going to offer a great customer experience. It's going to manage the channel interactions. It's going to manage my loyalty scheme um, and it's going to manage my prepaid card balance and interaction with any card schemes and the like. My core banking platform, that's going to carry on maintaining my current account and managing my, my kind of current account funds. It's going to be my, carry on being the customer data master because this is a bank. I've probably got a lot of stuff there. Um, it's going to carry on managing the bank's accounting, all of the payments engines, all of those things are going to remain unchanged. So if you take a kind of a typical scenario, you've got a flow through, you know, say I want to do a prepaid top up, my, my I request that from my channel, that's going to flow through, I'm going to request from my core that it reserves some funds in my account, it will do a funds check over here, um, it will confirm back to my new platform that it's reserved some funds if they're available, I will update my balance over on the new platform, and then I'll send a response back to say I've updated it and that will debit my current account so that those funds will finally be cleared out of my account. Okay, that's pretty simple. That's only three interactions. But every every one of those three interactions can fail in some interesting ways. It might not be able to get through. It might be temporarily unavailable. Um, I might not have the funds. So I've got both functional failures that can happen and I've got non-functional problems to deal with. Um, and I've also got um, a cloud availability architecture here. So this is probably a multi-availability zone, API-driven, eventually consistent architecture. And over on this side, I have got um, an HADR. So I've got two data centers, uh, relational databases, MQ managers, XA transactions, managing everything. So these are very different architectures that I've got to, to match together. So what we do is we introduce the concept of a kind of an integration layer in between them. We want this to be a lightweight thing. We're not looking to go and build more IT for the sake of IT. But what we're trying to do is encapsulate some of that complexity. Um, and, you know, we, and if this is a part of a migration journey, we only want this stuff to be there temporarily. Um, but it's amazing how many things that you put in temporarily are still there 10 or 15 years later. Um, so again, you need to build any of this stuff, anything throughout that continuum to be recoverable, robust and operable. You can't just say it's temporary and it'll be fine because it generally isn't. Um, and then we need to worry about the level of granularity. So I've talked about three calls here, but that's for only a single customer interaction. Um, the more calls we have here, the more logic we have to go and build both to do this and to do any compensating transactions and workflow, and I'll come back to that later. So the level of granularity drives the complexity on this interface a great deal. So it's really important that we don't um, let it balloon. So you don't want to turn this into just a data reads and writes level um, transactions, or you're going to have an enormous amount of housekeeping to do here the whole time. OK, so drilling down, what, what are the considerations on that boundary? Um, so, so some of those features down there. So, so data transfer and availability. So obviously, we've got two components living in separate worlds. and We need to make sure that they can come to a consistent view of the universe. I've talked about change data capture being a great way of streaming all of the changes in my old world into, um, into the new world or into a consistent data repository. And probably this component on the right, my traditional core platform, doesn't know anything's changed and neither do we want it to. You know, we want to minimize the amount of work we're doing on that core platform specifically to support the external world and maximize the reuse of what we've already got. So again, things like CDC give us some real advantages there. I touched on the non-functional characteristics. I've got a multi-availability zone cloud deposit. Um, architecture talking to a dual site traditional HADR architecture. So how am I going to manage my routing? How am I going to manage my failover and policies? Do I need to go and put circuit breakers in the middle? Because if I'm coupling my new architecture into my existing core, 
I still want my new architecture to have the high availability that it can. So I probably means there are circuit breakers sitting here in the middle as well to ensure that the left hand side can be available irrespective of what's going on on the right hand side. Data mapping and transformation. So um, when we're talking from, from kind of old to new or new to old, um, we may want to actually transform our messages you know, because it may be that we're trying to maximize the use of existing functionality that we've got on the right hand side. Um, so we want to transform our messages, but also, you know, kind of important considerations often are things like character sets. So do we need to do a UTF-8 to EBCDIC conversion? Uh, and that is not something you want to uh, discover at the last minute. Um, and I speak from experience on that. Um, security, you know, we've, we've talked about these are two very different, you know, so they're physically different um, IT data centers. Um, so you're going to be bridging, traversing multiple zones. And you know, we're, we're showing two components on this, but you're probably arraying a whole new set of functionality, particularly if we're following the strangler pattern where we're looking to get rid of this existing core and we're carving pieces away from it. Then we're going to have this proliferation of components around the outside. And we want to be able to add a consistent layer of security to all of them. So again, Agreeing that policy up front and making sure that's consistent for everyone is crucial, not just adopting a new one each time. Um, so transactionality, I'll return to in the next slide. Um, operations, um, what's running, what's broken, and, and how do I work out, you know, how do I triage my problems as to where things are broken? Um, again, a huge amount of the effort in getting a new system live and keeping it live is really in that operational space. And when you're bridging between these worlds, getting that consistent view to enable triage can be a nightmare. Um, and then the, the kind of the second, this second chunk of features, so transient features. So this is more about, I touched on, how do you get something live? How are we going to get this new product into service? And, and, and we want to minimize the customer impact there, particularly if this is a component that I'm actually transitioning out from my old world into the new world. So the customer doesn't need to know I've got some new technology. You don't want them to know. You don't want an outage. So you're going to need a roadmap for that change. And you need clarity on what in your integration layer is temporary and what's going to be there for the long haul. Um, from a deployment perspective, you need to know how you're going to roll all of this stuff out, because that is going to be crucial to your cutover strategy. You know, and are you able to use the same kind of DevSecOps processes on both sides of the house? Or do you actually have to integrate two different worlds to get this stuff live? And if you've got to roll back, how are you going to do that without kind of a massive overheads? And actually getting a good understanding of your data um, world is absolutely key to be being consistent in this space. And then finally, environments and test in testing environments. So we need to be able to test this integration. And whilst it's very easy for us to spin up cloud environments, it's quite difficult often to get hold of a consistent end-to-end -end integration test environment. So you need to consider those really early on in your product development lifecycle. OK, so patterns. So now we're firmly into good old distributed systems computer science. Um, everything is inherently eventually consistent now in our architecture. Um, because we have now broken apart our transactions. So the Saga pattern um, invented sometime in the 70s, where we have a series of local transactions. And then for each one of those, we have a compensating transaction to undo it if we've had a, um, a failure further down the chain is really our go-to pattern here. But that does mean that our developers have to write a bunch more code. For everything you can do, you need to be able to undo it. Um, and we no longer have atomic transaction. So what was once an atomic transaction on our mainframe or mid-range is now a set of individual transactions. So if we take the example earlier where I did my funds um, res reservation, uh, there is a point in time where I've reserved those funds, but I haven't updated my balance. So we no longer have that atomic update and atomic consistency. We also now have the concept of in-doubt transactions. So if my transaction fails, if my and, and then I so I try and roll back all the preceding steps, there's a good chance that say my database is broken somewhere, then that rollback transaction is also going to fail, leaving my overall transaction in doubt. And, and you need to better reconcile that. Similarly, orchestration comes in two flavors. So sorry, saga comes in two flavors, orchestration-based and choreography-based. So choreography-based, you leave it to the developers. 
Now that's not entirely desirable because that's driving a lot more code into your functional components. Orchestration based, you have a separate component to manage it and is probably more desirable. So where am I going to read my data from? So probably for things like um, available funds, you don't want to allow your customers to spend it twice, even though they're never going to mind. Um, so you're going to have to go to the source. But for things like your customer data, you know, you can afford to be more optimistic. Does it matter if you're a couple of seconds late with the update on the address? Almost certainly not. So you do have this whole bunch of edge cases that you need to deal with. So we have a whole bunch of tools in our toolbox for this. I'm not really going to dwell on this, um, but we have things like um, ZOS Connect that enables us to um, expose REST APIs from our core mainframe and, and expose those out to the industry, um, to, sorry, to the, to the other components, which is very valuable to reuse existing IT. And we have um, the emergence of transaction managers external to the, um, the traditional old mainframe transaction managers so kind of new components and actually many um, customers end up ultimately building their own in this space um, by accident because they're building them in that integration space. Again, we have queue managers bridging um, old to new and we have change data capture, um, which I've talked about at length. So just just to kind of wrap up in my talk. So I doubt I've said anything that is news to anyone. Um, this is all pretty obvious stuff. Um, but I guess the question is, so why isn't anyone doing this? You know, it's amazing how often we see a succession of MVP products that are quite short lived and they never quite make it into production service for the long haul. And that's why I've kind of in, avoided the term legacy within this um, this talk. So, you know, legacies are a kind of a good thing. I would like to be still delivering business value in tens of years time from the things I'm delivering today. So I don't always think legacy is a bad thing. So um, with that, I'll wrap up. I've got some guidelines on screen I wasn't going to talk about. And, and as they say in all the best BBC broadcasts, you know, if you've been affected by anything in this broadcast, uh, then please do please feel free to reach out to me. And my email is on the front of the presentation. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Thank you very much for your presentation. We still have uh, three minutes for, for question. Uh, right. So uh, I, I love what you say about, you know, legacy, uh, right? My first company, it was a great startup with uh, no legacy, only state of the art technology, no customers, right? You know, <laughs> because we were, we were having all the time we could for technology. And when you begin to have customers, uh, you know, uh, you, you share your resources to what you can. So yeah, legacy was a, a good decision at the time and it still delivers value today, right? So we agree on this. Yeah. I have a question for you about the complexity. So you never mentioned legacy, but there, you know, still uh, there are some uh, uh, current technologies and old technologies. Let's say, what's the complexity shift that you need to do from old system to new systems? What old complexity, right, you need to uh, abandon to manage a new kind of complexities that delivers more value today? I, th I think the, the, the kind of the crucial thing, the, the the way you get real value is finishing the job. So th something that we see really, really frequently is we start to to we we use our new technology to just hit the low hanging fruit. You know, so if we're moving, you know, we're going to move it. Well, right, got a new product system. I'll do the new cool product on the new product system, but I'll leave the old product system spinning. Right, you're never going to get away from that complexity. You have to go and tackle the hard problems and get those into that new ecosystem before you ever actually get to, to really leverage all of those technologies together. So it's, it's just far too easy to kind of follow the 80-20 rule, but we've moved 80% of the cross. Yeah, great, actually you've left 80% of the cost behind. You know, you've, you've done the new cool stuff. Now your IT estate is bigger because you've not got rid of the old stuff. You know, so if you want to replace stuff, so by all means kind of add new capability, but, but the real value comes when you finish the job and move, actually move the turn the old stuff off if you really want to leverage it. And that's the thing I see so often. People get a bit nervous towards the end of the program. Oh, it's all a bit hard now. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll stop now. We'll declare victory and we'll move on. And, and you know, that's that gets really difficult because then actually you've just your your IT estate is now costing you more, not less. And, and you know, that matters. And it's more complex. And you've got more moving parts. Yeah, I agree with you. There is a famous saying in finance that we say, uh, you get richer by paying your debt. It seems you get uh, faster by paying your technical debt at some point. Absolutely. Right? 
completely. <laughs> Uh, uh, one, one, uh, one last question on the uh, on APIs because you saw you showed some some uh, architectural patterns, right? And there is a saying that say APIs are as much as exposing interface to others internally or externally, as much as hiding interface about what you should not deliver to others or you don't want others to access to, uh, right? And it seems you say that you want to you want to you want to hide complexity from of the system to your users, internal or external. Right? Is is it what yep. you were trying to say? Ab absolutely. So, so when I was talking about that, picking the right level of abstraction for when you're calling between those two worlds, yeah, it's absolutely critical that you get the the right APIs. As I say, what you don't want to do is effectively have the create, read, update, delete, transaction level, old school CRUD level APIs because we, all you've just done is tightly coupled your old components to your new components you, and you've gained nothing. So you absolutely, you know, whether you get into domain driven design or however you want to do that, absolutely pick the right abstractions. Yeah. Thank you. That was uh, that was insightful. Thank you uh, very much, Paul, for uh, your presentation. And again, if you want to reach Paul, you will have uh, you know uh, to, uh, where to reach him on this first slide. Yeah, there is some uh, uh, some contact infos. You can reach him on LinkedIn, or you can go at IBM booth on the Partners Village, and you will be able to uh, connect with Paul and Paul's team about knowing more about what uh, what IBM can do for you. Thank you very much, Paul, uh, to be Thank there. You.